So the topic today is interaction elements and this content is taken from the Scott McKenzie book, uh, chapter three. So if you want to read a little bit more, you want a little bit more depth, um, you can go and have a read of that chapter. So interaction in terms of HCI is about when you're performing a task. Um, and that, that, that's the how we're going to frame uh, today's session. So some interactions or some task performances have a very specific goal. So you have a behaviour that you want to complete. So it might be that you want to send an email. It might be that you want to change the temperature on a thermostat. It could be any number of things. Some interactions involve a task where there isn't a clear goal. And these are the ones that are a bit more challenging um, because there's obviously an intention within that behaviour. So I want to click on this, I need to type this. But the overall behaviour doesn't really have a point. It's just I'm browsing the web or I'm chatting with my friends on Messenger. So fo focus on the, the idea that you've got a goal and you want to achieve this goal. So we're going to focus on the task performance where we've got an outcome that we want to achieve. So when you look at <coughs> um, interactions and interaction design, a lot of that links up well um, with more art types topics. Uh, so if you're interested in digital interaction design and you want to look into that a bit more, uh, Reese Rogers Sharp book there has got um, a, a lot more detail in terms of how you deal with the design aspect of things. So it's more linked to user experience, uh, focused on digital artifacts as opposed to something like product design. So we've seen this interaction cycle before. So this interaction cycle is uh, the interaction cycle where you've got a computer on one side, a human on the other side. And so previously we've seen the human side with sensors, cognitive, um, brain response and then physical responders. This lecture is a bit more focused on the displays and controls that you would see at the computer side. We're still not very interested yet in terms of what that machine state does, how the computer deals with a particular algorithm to figure out what a control should do and how it should display. We'll touch on it a little, but we're really interested in the displays and the controls themselves. If I can move, yeah. So in terms of input, so if we look at controls first, how I control a device, whether that's a computer or something that's a bit more uh, direct, so a touch screen. So there's direct or indirect. Direct is when I've got an immediate interface with the control, so I'm touching the thing that I want to change. So that's your touch screen, mobiles, tablets, that sort of thing. Indirect is, in my opinion, much more interesting because in indirect, you have a cursor, which is on the display, and then you have an input device, which is the physical thing. So it's a mouse, it's a button, it's a joystick, it's a lever, anything physical. And so you then have to figure out, okay, what's that relationship between my input device that I have, my mouse, and how that is displayed on the screen as a cursor. Uh, then there's another layer, which is how do I then indirectly manipulate that control so I have to move my mouse and then click on a button. So that one tends to be a little bit more complex. Controls themselves can be hard controls or soft controls. So a hard control is something that has a very uh, single purpose. It's maybe a physical it's a physical device so it will be a, a button in on a uh, Think of like a music mixing desk. There are buttons that have very specific purposes and they're only for that purpose. Soft controls, however, is like that uh, image shown. So it's the text editing image from a word processor. It's an interface that's created in software. So it's a, a digital control. It's something that I'm manipulating, but I'm not physically uh, touching as a control device. Um, however, what you often find with soft controls is the waters get muddied somewhat. So is this really a display also? So yes, it is because you can tell that italic and underline is selected. The affordance of that there is that it's clearly depressed 
and same with the, the left uh, text align button. So you can see straight away, actually, this is telling me, it's displaying to me <clears throat> what is happening with my text. So this is a key component of a, a what you see is what you get interface. Very clearly, it's italic, it's underlined, it's left aligned. So that soft control has a dual purpose. It can be used as a display as well. And that tends to be useful for us because there's less cognitive load of me having to link my control to the display, if it's the same thing. It lends itself very much to that direct manipulation of a touch screen that I can click on with my finger and edit that display. So this kind of interaction between what is a control and what is a display is something that people have been researching for a very long time. So another example is scroll bars and sliders. So this is probably an indirect input. It's stylized as a little bit older. Um, it could be a direct input if you have a touch screen, but it's probably going to be manipulated using the mouse. Um, it's a soft control. It's physical. It's uh, on the screen rather than being physical. Um, and is it a display? Uh, well, there are certain cues that we can take from it, which tell us something about the state of the device. So yes, I would say it is a display. So if you look at the slider, you can see that on the left side, I'm displaying probably about half of the area that I could. On the right hand side, I'm displaying a much smaller fraction of the area uh, because you can see that slider bar is much smaller. So I'm going to have to move it around a lot more to see everything. So how these control, controls and displays are linked together and how you can represent them as a complete, uh, a complete interaction is known as a control display, control display relationship. And it's basically to do with the operation of a control results in an effect on a display. So if you think of a mouse, I've got my mouse here, I'm moving the mouse and that's being reflected on the display. What you might see uh, is a difference in how that happens, um, and we'll talk about that later. So that control display uh, ratio or CD ratio, CD gain. Uh, so sometimes you use a mouse and it's much slower than your mouse or much faster than your mouse. and There's that kind of adjustment period. So there's lots of things that we can manipulate within that control display relationship. Sometimes they're known as mappings. So you might see them listed to as a control display mapping. And the reason it's listed as a mapping is because I'm having to, to map or make a relationship between um, how I deal with the input and what the output is on the screen, what that display looks like. So in this the top example, we have a very natural display. I can move my mouse left and right, and the display will also move left and right. So that spatial congruence matches up. So that's easy for me to figure out. However, the bottom one is a learned response. So that wasn't natural. It's natural now because you've used the mouse almost your whole life, but it's not natural the first time you use it. You have to learn that you have to move your control forward for the display to go up. So there's lots of kind of funny stories of people saying uh, that there was, you know, particularly the elderly who didn't have that cognitive ability, perhaps when they were learning to use a computer, they would lift the mouse off the mouse pad to try and make it move up the screen, which because that's the most natural display is that if I move it, it reflects on the screen in the same way that I move it. So this spatial congruence, as that changes, you perhaps maybe have to learn something about what that interaction looks like. So you can map this. You can draw a control display map, uh, which is this table on the right hand side. So take my mouse, I can move my mouse along an x-axis, which is left to right. I can move it along the y-axis, which would be lifting it up off of the mouse pad, physically straight up off the desk. Or I can move it in the z-axis, which is pushing it away from me. The display, however, only has an x and y-axis. It's a 2D interface. So my control would move on the x-axis and the cursor change would display 
as moving on the x-axis. So that's my natural. It's a nice straight line. No need to really... Uh, the, the cognitive load is, is quite low. If I consider to move on the y-axis, so an increase on the y-axis has to occur due to an increase in the z-axis of the control. So those little plus signs next to it just mean that an increase in one axis leads to an increase on the other axis. So moving my mouse to the right would increase it on the x-axis and that would also be moved to the right on the screen which would be an increase in the display x-axis. So there's lots of um, art exhibitions which mess around with this combination. Uh, so you've perhaps seen someone changes your screen 180 degrees, how hard is it to use the mouse to get it to go back. Everyone always ends up kind of standing upside down trying to put yourself in the same position so that this learned relationship you have with the control still holds true. It's very hard to figure out that if I move right the mouse moves left because it's so ingrained in how we interact with technology. Uh, for someone who's new, if you were only taught as a child that a positive increase in the control leads to a negative uh, change in the display, it would be very different. But we've become accustomed to this. So this is if I'm uh, just moving something along the X and Z axis, or the Y axis perhaps. Um, but if you consider something in 3D, so the example here is an Etch-a-Sketch, uh, but if you consider something in 3D, I've now got six degrees of freedom. Previously I had three degrees of freedom for position, x, y and z. Now I've got theta x, theta y and theta z, which is to do with if I uh, rotated around that axis. So if you consider that you've got a, a door handle that twists, that's a rotation around the z axis. If you're in the cockpit of a plane, uh, perhaps you've got a button directly above your head, a knob that you can twist, that's going to be a rotation around the y-axis. So these six degrees of freedom add some more complication to it, because not only can I move to a positive or negative change along an axis, but I can move it around an axis. So you can pause the video here and try and create a CD gain mapping for an Etch-a-Sketch. So if you've never seen an Etch-a-Sketch before, just in case, you can twist these two white knobs at the bottom. One will make a change in the y-axis and one will make a change in the z-axis. So this is what that looks like. Um, you could put um, a plus on all of these because uh, if you, to around the theta z, same with that door handle, it's twisting around the axis straight ahead of you, which is the z axis. If I increase one of those knobs, I should see an increase in the z axis, so it would draw a line along the z axis. If I move the other one, it should see an increase in the, the y axis. Um, and if obviously if you turn both knobs at the same time, you can start to get somewhere between that 90 degrees. So you should be uh, kind of comfortable drawing these control display diagrams. Uh, think about what would be a control display diagram for um, a mouse, for a joystick. Think of a Wii controller, how does that work? Start to kind of build up some idea in your head of what these axes look like and how you can display like real-time controls that you've used um, on this mapping diagram. So the most natural response uh, is, is this. So this is a, a hand. Uh, so we've got so a glove with lots of sensors on it which will detect movement and the display is a hand. So that display is exactly how you manipulate your hand. So any positive change in the control will result in a positive change in the display. So for this one, there is no learning required. So this is the most natural option that you can have in a control display relationship. So once you have that relationship, you have control, 
you can manipulate that control and you can see that change in the display. You need to kind of build on that. You need to think of, okay, what's the CD gain or the CD ratio? So this quantifies the amount of movement on a display for a given amount of controller movement. So what that means is a control display ratio of one to one means that the amount that I move my mouse is exactly how much it moves. So if I put my mouse at the exact left position of my screen and I move it across and it reaches the exact right position, the distance covered is exactly the same. If I want to speed this up and people who are uh, would be deemed expert users, so people who play lots of games, for example, or mouse click games, uh, they tend to have a much faster CD ratio. So that would be perhaps for the distance that I move. If I'm increasing that CD ratio, the amount that the cursor moves will increase for the amount that the controller moves. So that my controller might move one, a distance of one and my display might move 10. So you can see that there's some uh, interaction between these in terms of how quickly I can move to something, but also how accurate I can be. So you see the, the little box there says enhanced pointer position. What that means is it does actually slow down slightly when you reach something that's clickable. And the reason it does that is because of this. So this is the optimization of CD gain. It's a, a balance between movement and accuracy. It's a balance between gross positioning and fine positioning. So this line here, the gross positioning time. So if I have a very low CD gain, it's going to take me a long time to get into the vicinity of something that I want to click. So I might have to move my mouse along, lift it up, move it back to the other side of the mouse pad and move. So there might be that lifting of something to make it move. On the other hand, if my CD gain, whoops, sorry, if my CD gain is high, then the amount of time it takes me to get anywhere is, is very low. But at the same time, if my CD gain is very high, it takes me a little bit longer to select something to make that fine positioning. So if I have an icon over here, my mouse is up here, and as I'm moving down, so I've got an icon here, and then my mouse is up here. And if I have a very fast CD ratio, it's easy for me to, to overshoot where I want to be. And that's the most, um, that's the, the challenging part. So the optimal setting is right in the middle. The optimal setting is I have a CD gain which allows me to move quickly enough, but also to be accurate enough. And that will be different for everybody. And as you uh, become more and more expert, what you'll find is this whole chart will shift to the right so that that sweet spot will actually move a little bit further and a little bit further. And there's lots of techniques that we can use for this fine positioning time. So one is the optimization that's inbuilt already, which slightly slows it when you reach a clickable point. Uh, the other thing is that it would perhaps jump or snap onto things so that as I go past an icon, it would stop on it for a second so that I can select it if I wanted to. Uh, you can do things like have clickable areas slightly just outside the icon. So this is what happens with uh, mobile devices, for example. You have an icon, but there's a little pixel border around it which is also clickable. So you don't have to be as accurate as you perhaps think you need to be in order to do it. So lots of effort and lots of research goes into fine-tuning this uh, CD gain and optimising it uh, so that people can use it. But what you really need to be aware of is that low CD gain means I can get somewhere. Um, it will take a long time to get there, but I'll be very accurate once I get there. For high CD gain, it's going to take me, you know, not a lot of time to get to something, but because of that potential for overshooting, it's going to take me a bit more time to be accurate once I get there. So some things to consider in relation to that. Um, if you've got a very small screen, how does that affect your uh, CD gain? Uh, well, if you've got a very small screen and you have a big CD gain, you can go off the screen very quickly. 
So perhaps if your screen is very small, your CD gain might be smaller. If you've got a very large screen, and I have to move my mouse, if it's quite a low CD gain, I'm going to have to do that thing where I have to lift my mouse and move it, lift my mouse and move it back all the time. Uh, so there is a difference. Uh, often uh, mouse controls are quite smart, so they'll change the CD gain based on the resolution and screen size that they know they're working on. Uh, remote pointing is a challenge. Uh, so if you think of like the Wii Remote, for example, if I have to move, if I have a very big screen in front of me and I have to point at something, if I've got a 60 inch screen, that gross movement to get from one side to the other is very big. It's probably going to engage my whole arm. And then I need to have some accuracy when I get there, which is probably in the wrist to get the specifics of where I want to click. Uh, so as that screen changes, uh, the amount of arm movement is probably going to change as well. And if you've got a small screen, it's easy to just manipulate using the wrist. If you're in front of a large wall projector, it's much harder. Uh, a brief diversion to modes. Uh, modes are something that we tend not to see um, nowadays. Uh, we tend to see it a lot in terms of like switching things on or off. So the mode can be on or off. Off in uh, you know older phones, you would find that you could use the mode would change. Uh, same with like uh, you know you know old school Casio watches and that sort of stuff. There's lots of modes where one button can. Uh, lead you to different situations, different conditions. Yeah, so the one that you might see most of, which this is going to make more sense, is caps lock. So caps lock is a mode which is either on or off, meaning you've either got uppercase or lowercase. So being aware that there are some times when we do still use modes, we don't use them ex as extensively as previously in history, uh, but they are still a thing that, that happens. So things like, uh, if we go back to that uh, kind of soft control display that we have, so in this case it's maybe at something like a PowerPoint and you can see that the slide is active. So the slide view is active. I could select slide sorter and it would switch that on to the slide shorter. So you have that ability to switch between different display modes. Uh, the watch is that you can cycle through different options. So you might be able to cycle through uh, a timer, an alarm, and move between them just by pressing, but you can only cycle through in a certain order. So the difference here is that I have uh, multiple controls in the top example. So I've got multiple buttons or soft controls that I can click on, uh, whereas I have a single single input to switch the modes on the watch and how people interact with those two things is going to be very different. Uh, so this up till now has been kind of quite based on mouse input, physical input, uh, so really lending itself towards desktop displays and a lot of the early research into interaction design was very much based on desktop displays. Um, so as once GUIs became a thing, that was really the focus. Now, there's a lot more focus on the mobile context and how we can take things that we know about control display relationships and how can we put them into the mobile context. So mobiles are really very uh, linked to natural uh, relationships. It's very much a direct manipulation and changing the control by directly manipulating it. So that linear display for uh, brightness, if I drag and drop up that, drag, not drag and drop, drag the control, that little circle to the right, I'm increasing the brightness and to the left, I'm decreasing it. So it's a very natural, very linear relationship. Uh, but sometimes people still use a dial. So you can see that there's a dial here, so we're, this is uh, kind of volume, 
for example. Uh, the control is I'm twisting the dial. That is manipulation around the z-axis, rotation around the z-axis, so theta z, and it's changing the display, which is y. The control for the natural relationship is linear, which reflects, so it's a change in the y-axis. Uh, so the only difference here is that that's then that ma my display matches my control, and that's why that's used a lot in mobile devices because it's a very clear natural display. There's the relationship is simple, but also they're the same, the same uh, design. You can design a control and display that do the same thing. If you were to use that learned relationship at the top with the twist and then the, the vertical display, you would A, take up more space, um, but again, that cognitive load is greater. So designers tend to favour where you can have the control and display as a straight mapping. That means it's a natural relationship, and it means that people are going to be able to pick it up and understand straight away what it does. So mobile, mobile interaction, one of the the most common actions that we do is we click on things. So one example is that we're clicking on a keyboard. We might be clicking on an app icon, we might be selecting something within the app, we might be pressing a volume, a soft volume control, uh, but the fat finger problem is a problem. So the idea that we're occluding the thing that we want to click on, so in this case I'm trying to click on the D, uh, but I can't see it because my finger's over the top. So some of the things that we've started to do is um, an offset cursor. So I could click just slightly below or slightly above and it would still work. I also have a, a display which is slightly offset to the point at which I click. So it displays that D just above my finger so I know for sure that I've clicked on the right thing. I compare that to a physical keyboard and I know I've clicked on it because I have that nice physical feedback. So ta tactile feedback is something that people use a lot to say that they've clicked on something because if you click on an extra key by mistake you get a double vibration so people use it as a, a method of checking that they've typed properly. Very few people actually still use that uh, vibration for keys. It's one of the first things that people tend to, to switch off but uh, some people tend to still use it, particularly older users still use that vibration because they like the confirmation they like the tactile confirmation that actually I press the button. Uh, one of the other things that we've done or you know, design has worked on is that there's now a takeoff selection. So rather than me press selecting the key when I press down, as is the case with a physical keyboard, the key is selected when I let go. So that if I do press the wrong button, I can slide over to the correct one and let go. And so the number of keys that I need to enter, it's still one press and one release. If it was selection on the down press, I would have to press the wrong key, then delete, then press the right key. So I'm, I've got three times as many uh, presses effectively than if I can slide across and select something different. Uh, Multi-touch. How you interact with technology now is becoming much more complex. So original technologies, it recognised one press, and then it maybe recognised two presses, and now it can recognise all ten of my fingers. So if you think of a, a flat display, like a, a desk a tabletop display, like a Microsoft Surface type thing, it can detect not only my ten fingers, but it can detect other people's ten fingers. So it can detect way more than just 10 points of contact. So it means that there's a nice collaborative opportunity there. But how do I remember multiple gestures? How do I know what gestures are? Are gestures flexible enough so that in terms of how they're programmed into the device so that if I do it slightly differently, what's the margin of error? Can I still interact with it or do I have to be very 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 precise? So all of these are things that we need to consider 
when we're looking at designing. And one of the one of the things that's becoming more and more popular is pressure. And so we can use pressure to determine how someone clicks or selects something, and we can use that to our advantage. Uh, so pressure tells us a lot of things. So pressure can tell us if someone, some people will just naturally press harder. Some people will slightly roll their finger when they press something. And so the computer can start to detect something about your behavior and recognize you when compared to someone else. And one way that we've used, so taking those tabletop devices like the Surface, we can use passwords, uh, use pressure to start to determine passwords. So this is an example of a paper that was presented at a conference called Pressure Faces. And what happened was they detect, they wanted to compare um, using numbers and then faces, how easy it is for someone to use pressure to select something. So rather than lifting my finger to click, I just use pressure to make the selection so that it's much more difficult for someone to shoulder surf. It's much more difficult for someone to come along beside me and actually see whether or not I'm what I'm clicking on. So the paper was looking at how easy it is for people to do and whether people can actually guess what uh, is being selected. And they, they have some discussion of cameras and whether cameras could be detecting things. So if you put a lot of pressure, the top of your mail goes white. So can cameras detect that small change in colour and therefore guess people's passwords uh, better than people who are just watching you do it because they maybe can't see those subtle changes. So this was what the setup looked like. So they had uh, one person was a person in the middle and he had been given a set password that he had to enter. And they had two people either side who were the shoulder surfers, they were the observers. So they had four different uh, systems. They had one that was just entering pin number on like a zero to nine keypad. One was selecting faces with a similar type layout. And then they had two options for pressure. So this was that you could, uh, if I wanted to select, so if you take the guy there, I want to select the one at the very bottom of that image. He would press the blue on his right hand and the yellow on his left hand just by applying pressure. And where those two would overlap is the bit that's connected. Uh, so they had people uh, it's like trying to guess what uh, passwords were being put in. And the pin number they guessed just over 70% of the time. Faces, just over 20%. Pressure, pin, so using the numbers, they guessed about 15% uh, of the time. And using faces, nobody guessed the correct answer at all. Uh, so, they get, uh, so they did guess some components of it. Uh, so they did guess some, uh, so like, okay, they could guess one letter or one face, uh, but nobody guessed all of them. Uh, so how I move to the target, this is just a, a brief um, aside <laughs> so that you, you, you know that this exists. Uh, so Fitz Law is a model of how someone interacts with uh, uh, control and a display. It's probably the biggest researched area of interaction design and control display relationships and it's to do with predicting how quickly I can move from a start position, which is where my cursor is, to a target area, which is related to how far away that is and how big that target is. So it was originally developed in 1954 and it was uh, originally tested using a stylus, uh, but it's modeling the act of moving something. It does uh, largely hold true for fingers, so for direct input as well. There, there are some subtle differences in terms of how that operates, um, but certainly for a mouse cursor it's very, very predictive and it's very closely modeled to that act of pointing or moving my device. Uh, so, yeah, there's a video there, a YouTube link that you can go and have a look at if you're interested. Uh, but basically what it says is that you have the time taken is 
uh, related to this index of difficulty. You don't need to know the equation, this is just if you're interested, um, but there's a small change in the distance for a small target will have a bigger effect than a small change in distance for a big target. So as it gets bigger and as it gets further, as it gets bigger, it becomes easier and as it gets further away, it becomes more difficult to select. So we have three targets. Uh, target A and B are the same size. Target C is smaller. And so target C and target A are the exact same distance apart. Target B is further away than the other two. So the time taken to reach A is shorter than any of the other targets because the distance for the cursor to target A and target C is the same. That's the shortest distance. But because target A is bigger, it's easier to select. So if you think back to that um, uh, speed accuracy trade-off that we have, I don't have as much challenge when I get there because my accuracy can be slightly off because it's a bigger target. So if you want to uh, have a go, uh, you can. Uh, so this was uh, how Fitz Law was first created. So the very first study was about using pencil and paper and the idea was that it was replicating a stylus. So ironically, something that really has become very big in terms of mouse action was originally developed for something like a PDA. Um, so there was boxes and you had to move along the x-axis to select those boxes and there was a time. The time limit was let's say 10 seconds and you had to see how many times you could click inside those boxes within 10 seconds. Then calculated accuracy as well as the number of overall attempts which was the ones you missed and the ones you got in the box. And then it would calculate uh, how easy that link was. Uh, so it was a repeated measures design. So you did lots of trials. It was a thin subject design. So everybody did everything. And it was comparing the size and distance. After the study, those were combined into that index of difficulty that we saw the logarithmic uh, measure. Uh, but to start with, they were two separate, two separate things. So this gets expanded. Uh, so Fitz Law largely holds true for touchscreens, uh, but the problem with touchscreen is that because of our physiology, it's very hard to be accurate with a fingertip because a fingertip is uh, very subject to pressure, for example. And so the angle that you put that on the device will make a big difference as to the accuracy. So you can try this by like, making sure trying to put your finger as flat as possible and then just trying to put your finger at like 45 degrees and then at 90 degrees to the table you can see that the difference in how accurate you can be is different and so the orientation you're holding the device makes a big change um, whether it's your right hand or left hand makes a big change and all of these things I mean like you, you would never use your mouse in your less dominant hand, but we quite often use mobile devices with a less dominant hand, for example. So if you're interested in finding a bit more about how you model finger touches, uh, Google has done some investigation into updating Fitz Law to take into account... Uh, oh, my phone just activated for Google, hang on. According to Wiktionary, take into account... So Google has done this... Uh, test to update Fitz Law for touch. Uh, so you can go and have a look. Uh, it's fairly mathematical, um, but some of the descriptions are quite useful. Uh, so this is in the ACM. So if you want to get to it, you go to dl.acm.org. Uh, just type in that, uh, that title and it will come up. You need to be on campus to access it or using the uh, VPN. If the computing VPN doesn't work, try the university VPN because that is sometimes a bit more successful. Okay, so you can you can try this yourself if you want to. Uh, just print out this slide and try and see, give yourself 10 seconds and see how many times you can touch each box within those 10 seconds with a pen and see how see how accurate you are. Okay, so the other main thing within uh, the mobile context is gestures. So if you think of gestures in general in terms of as, as a 
person, how I would gesture. They're very kinesthetic, so there's lots of movement. Um, they're very communicative. Gestures tend to add a lot uh, to communication. Um, sometimes they're intentional, sometimes they're not intentional. Uh, so, uh, for example, sometimes like if you're presenting, you might pay a lot of attention to your body language and make very intentional gestures to, to highlight things or to emphasise points. Uh, so politicians are particularly good at um, intention-based gestures uh, to aid communication. So there'll be a lot of pointing, a lot of banging on the table, a lot of kind of shrugs of the shoulders and things, which, which all have an intent, which is to add to their communicative message. Um, but the, the main thing with gestures is that they do have a very uh, cultural significance or um, inherent meaning. And some gestures that are acceptable in some cultures would be very strange in other cultures. So if you consider the Inuit greeting of rubbing noses in you know, the Western and European culture, that's really an invasion of my personal space. And so they have a very different um, interpretation of those gestures depending on the culture. Same applies for mobile devices. So this is uh, screen-based devices, uh, but also things like Leap Controller, Connect, uh, AR things like HoloLens, anything that's using um, some kind of uh, physical movement, which would be a device-based gesture. Uh, so you want to recreate the, you need to reset the compass on your phone. So I don't know who uses the compass these days, but sometimes it screws up. <coughs> <coughs> screws up your maps and you need to reset the compass. That's a device-based gesture, isn't it? because you're moving the device in a certain space, you're creating the infinity symbol with the device. Some can be body-based gestures, so they tend to be things like connect, so you're making a certain shape with the body that it will recognise. So if we think of just screen-based devices, so we're thinking of just a mobile phone and what gestures we know of, there are some gestures that are, you know, everyone will say, they're very clear, very common gestures that have a clear meaning. So things like tapping, double tapping, dragging things, flicking things. Uh, you can pinch and spread, which is typically zoom, zoom in and out. Uh, you can extended press, so long press something. Uh, press and tap tends to be less common, but you can hold one finger down and touch with a second finger. Uh, for a while that was kind of floated as a, the equivalent of a right click on a mouse. Uh, now the more direct uh, link between a mouse right click tends to be uh, the press option, the long press option. So if you're interested in gestures uh, you can check out this book, Designing Gestural Interfaces, um, but this is kind of the summary of what they say gestures need to be. So if you're designing gestures they've got to be discoverable. I have to be able to find it to know that it's a gesture. I have to trust that that gesture is going to work. It has to respond to me. It's got to do something. There's got to be some meaning. It's not just a gest gesture has to link to an action. Uh, playful gestures tend to be very good because people want to repeat because they have some uh, positive internal response. So you get a nice dopamine response if you're engaging in a playful activity. Uh, so that gives you this kind of pleasure and then you'll remember uh, what it is and gestures need to be good. You can read the book to find out what that is. So uh, one of the kind of, well this is probably one of my favourite papers ever written and um, it's written by Julie Williamson and Stephen Brewster uh, at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Julie's now married and that's why it's under a maiden name Julie Rico. A lot, all the current work is under Julie Williamson. Uh, but what they were doing, they were looking at social acceptability of gestures. Uh, so what they were saying was, you know, how do we know which gestures people will use in different places and how do we know what gestures are acceptable in different circumstances? So what they did was they looked at a number of device-based gestures and body-based gestures. So they came up with some kind of weird and wonderful things and some that were a bit more uh, kind of subtle. Uh, so device-based gestures, examples, you know, a whip-like movement of the device in the hand, 
tapping the device while it's in your pocket, squeezing the device with your hand, um, shaking the device up and down in an either even rhythm. Uh, Body-based gestures could be like rotating your shoulders, tapping your nose, nodding your head, rotating your wrist, clapping your hands, all of these things which were very physical. You had, you had to move the body in ways that maybe you wouldn't yet use in order to interact with the device. So what they did was they took people to a variety of different locations. They took people to things like the subway. Uh, they had them in a room. They had them in a room with other people. Uh, they had them uh, just basically a, a wide variety of settings. And they figured out that the ones that seemed a bit weird, so ones that were uncommon or could be viewed as attention seeking. Uh, so things like clapping, uh, who's going to stand in the subway and suddenly start clapping, that draws attention to me. I don't like that. Um, anything that interferes with communication, so would it be a distraction to communication if I have to keep tapping on my nose all of the time? Um, that's going to interrupt the flow of my conversation. And if it's an uncommon movement, so how often do you use like a whip-like gesture with your phone? Not very often. And so that attracts attention as well. Uh, so. People wanted things that kind of were quite subtle, so things like tapping it in my pocket, uh, putting some pressure around the grip on my phone. And, but it very much depended on where they were and who else was there. So if I'm in a room on my own, I'm much more likely to be accepting of the nose tap gesture than I am standing with a group of friends at the subway. So a lot of it is fairly what you would expect, but in terms of study design, in terms of um, kind of the thought processes that have gone into, I think it's really good. So if you have a spare, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you can go and download it, just read the discussion section and the introduction. If you don't want to read the whole study, you'll, you'll get the ideas from those parts. Uh, okay, so moving on, the biggest thing really that's hitting mobile devices now in terms of how we interact with them is biometrics. So biometrics is measuring a unique physical and behavioural characteristic in order to identify um, an individual, so typically the owner of the device. So if we're using biometrics for authentication, a password is something you know, right? So this is the basic level. You have a password, you type in the password, and we assume that you're the only person who knows the password. You might have a device authentication, so Google's very big on this, Apple caught up. Uh, Apple did it more recently. Uh, so if I want to log into a device, so and I'm using a new laptop, I want to log into iCloud.com, I'm using a new laptop. It doesn't recognise that device. So it's going to tell me, hey, you've got to use another device that you own to authenticate you as being the correct person. So I can type a code into my other device, I can select something that's displayed on the screen, but I can give more confidence that the person logging into that browser is me. However, if there's something that I am that nobody else is, then that gives you more confidence again. So fingerprint, for example, uh, I know for sure that my fingerprint is mine. It's different from other people's fingerprints. And so the device can be confident that it's me. What the device can't be confident about, of course, is whether I willingly authenticated or whether someone chopped my finger off and, and used it to access all my money. I don't know. But being something that I am, that's the biometrics. Something that's unique to me and something that no one else can be. So some examples. Um, my fingerprint. It's the most commonly used one. Most mobile phones these days will have some kind of fingerprint uh, recognition. Uh, facial recognition, so Face ID on uh, Apple. That's recognising who I am. Hands and veins geometry, this is becoming more popular. So the veins on the back of your hand, uh, you can kind of see a pattern. And already people are looking at trying to identify individuals from that. So currently it's being used to identify people in historical sex crime cases and this kind of thing. Uh, so there, there's typically hands in those in images. So they can try to direct, so link those images to a suspect. 
So currently the, it's not really used widely for that yet, just because of the burden of proof in Scottish courts. Uh, but it's getting there and they're using computing to just basically do, well, very close to Dijkstra's algorithm to determine whether or not those veins are the same as your veins. Uh, it could be iris or retinal scan, could use my DNA. Sitting pressure is a newer one, uh, so a very physical how I sit on a chair. Uh, so newer cars will use sitting pressure to adjust. So if I get in a car, it knows, can detect by the way I sit down who I am, and it will then move the seat and the mirrors and adjust my to get my selected temperature. And so it customizes the vehicle based on who sits in the seat. Uh, there's more behavioural things that can be detected, so speech recognition. I can use my signature and it can use um, image recognition to detect whether or not that signature is mine. It can detect who I am by how I walk, so as I walk up to a device it will know whether or not it's me. Um, my keystroke, so this is something that I've started to be used um, in addition to passwords. So how I enter my passwords, the flow of typing things, it's going to be different than someone who's managed to obtain my password and has just typed it in, you know, click, 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 whereas I might go click, 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 click. So those keystrokes are unique to me. So that's been quite effective, actually. Um, GCHQ are very big on this because it will detect whether or not someone is using their own password or whether or not someone is not. And what they've discovered is that you... It's very hard for individuals to break that behavioural habit. So I've been typing my password in multiple times a day in my own kind of keystroke manner. And then if you say to me, I'll try and hide that it's you, typically you, the user will first slow down, but it will still be the same keystroke pattern. It takes a good, can't remember the number, I think it was like five to seven attempts before you can fill the system into full thinking that it's not you. And that, after a period of time, quite a short period of time, so after a few hours, you lose that ability again. So some very subtle things that you can use to detect uh, behaviour uh, for biometrical purposes. Uh, so we will discuss biometrics a little bit more in the class. Uh, so be good before we come to the next class if you can have a think of what you think the next big thing in biometrics is, uh, maybe have a little bit, do a little bit of research as to uh, what you can see out there, is there anything new on the horizon, anything that you think is a bit disturbing, anything that you think has been successful so far, um, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion of that in the class next time. Thank you very much.